Last time we looked at the standard normal distribution, so I just want to write down a couple of uh, key factors here to refresh your memory. Uh, we talked in some detail about how to construct this normal curve. It has to stay above the horizontal scale. It's bell-shaped. It's the, uh, <clears throat> the standard normal distribution, also known as the z-distribution, because this is the distribution that is linked to our z-score. And in particular, the mean is equal to zero and the standard deviation is one. This is the only standard de um, standard or the normal distribution that we're going to be looking at uh, in, at the first part today. All of our graphs will be uh, like this. And we also talked about that right in the middle is where you're going to have the mean. And so in this case, the mean is zero. And then we're going to number our scale by one. And you can see as you move from the middle to the first standard deviation, that standard deviation is one. And on, if you go the other way, you're going to be going into the negatives. So this is the picture that we're going to graph um, over and over and over again. Remember the z-score formula? We actually have a couple of them. There was one where we used the sample uh, statistics. And we would calculate the, the uh, z-score in that way. Uh, a similar one, if we were in a different context, we would use the population parameters, the population mean and the population standard deviation. And you're going to have um, different z-score formulas, several of them moving forward. But just remember what the interpretation of the z-score is. It's the number of standard deviations a data value falls from the mean. So this scale works perfectly because if we happen to find a z-score of one, which puts us right here on the axis, we would say that this data value is one standard deviation above the mean. And it works perfectly, the interpretation for this graph. What else? The uh, 68, 95, 99.7 rule. So let's take a look at this and, and let me show you that you've actually been calculating these probabilities long um, already. So the variable of this axis is the z. And you're going to be asked to calculate probabilities. And so the first one I'd like to calculate is the probability that z is greater than or equal to zero. Now last time, we made a point to draw the connection between, all right, this is a density curve. Uh, and what that means is that the area under the curve is equal to one. And one, as you can think of that, is 100%. A fraction of one would be a lower percentage under 100. And so if all the area underneath this curve is equal to one, then if we wanted to calculate the probability that z is greater than zero, we would draw this picture. And for every one of these probabilities, we are going to draw a graph. Because if you draw the graph, and all right, so z greater than, greater than zero, would be from here on over, going out to infinity. And then what we're going to do is we're going to shade the area under the graph that corresponds to z greater than or equal to zero. And then we're going to ask the graph, or we're going to ask the question, what is this area? If the area under the entire curve is equal to one, then what's the area of this blue shaded region? Just let me know that you're following along. You can put the answer in the chat or just yell it out. Yeah, that's right. The whole area is one, and this represents exactly half of it. So the area is equal to 0.5. And now last time we said, well, it turns out that when we calculate a probability in this setting, if the area, the area and the probability are going to correspond to one another, we know probabilities have to be numbers between 0 and 1. So any probability that we calculate in this context 
and we shade a region, that region will either be somewhere between zero and one. And so the area here is equal to 0.5 or the probability is equal to 0.5. We made the connection last time that the area under the curve, that the probability that corresponds to the same region. We talked about the proportion of outcomes of Z values. And you know, we also said if we interpret it, <clears throat> we, can, we can do a percent. So all four of those numbers will be very closely related. Some, most of them will be equal to one another. All right, now that, I, um, now that we've done that one, um, let's focus in on the empirical rule here. And what do you suppose this is? It's just very abstract sitting there. It doesn't have a whole lot of meaning. But what you should do is to link this probability to a region on the normal curve. Because if you can do that, then you can get a sense of how large or how small, how close to zero, how small, or how large, close to one, the probability actually is. So here's zero, here's negative one, and here's one. And I'm just going to draw the rest of the, the normal scale here. And then I'm going to shade the region that corresponds to the probability on the number line. Z is somewhere between negative one and one. And then the shaded region would represent, under the curve, would be this region here. So the idea is to graph the z values on the horizontal scale and then shade everything above, underneath the curve, everything above. Knowing what this area is, is the same thing as the probability. All right, so what do you think this area is? It's the area under the normal curve between negative one and one. And if you link that to the, the empirical rule, the 68, 99.7 rule, what would you guess this area to be approximately? Okay, so to uh, answer this, here's the mean, here's the standard deviation, and we know that 68% of all the outcomes will fall in this region within one standard deviation, 95 will fall within this region, and 99.7 will fall within this region. So let me ask again, and go ahead and put your uh, answer in the chat. What is this shaded region here? Because if we can figure out what that shaded region is, it's a number between zero and one, then that, if that we know the area, then we also know the probability. Okay, good. Yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about. Now, we're not, we're not going to write 68% here, but we're going to write the number that makes sense for a probability, and that's the number between 0 and 1. So we're going to write the decimal equivalent of 68%. That's right. So you've had a little bit of uh, a practice with this, but you can see that if we just use the empirical rule, our, uh, we're very limited in the number of probabilities that we can calculate. You know, you can even... You can even ask this question and use the slices of the of the um, normal curve. So, for example, what's the probability that Z is between 1 and 2? You know, do not attempt this problem without well, later you will, but right now I'm going to try to get you in the habit of drawing the normal curve and shading the appropriate region. All right. So here's zero and one and two and let's say three. And for our probability here, um, Z values are between one and two. If I graph that here, we're looking at this region right here. Z is between 1 and 2. So I'm going to shade the area underneath the graph. And I say that you can approximate this one as well with the empirical rule here. If you remember, we inserted a bunch of, of rates. We know that 68% go in here. 
And so we said, well, this is 34% and this is 34%. And then we deduced, if you go out one more standard deviation, you have 95. And if you take 95 and subtract the middle 68, you left with 27. And then you have to split the 27 in half. So these two turned out to be 13.5%. And then when you went out even further and you had 99.7 would be within three standard deviations and 95% is within sta uh, um, two standard deviations, then 99.7 minus 95 is equal to 4.7. And so if you divide 4.7 in half, you get 2.35. And so that's why we put 2.35% in this region and in this region. And that's, that leaves only 0.3% for the outsides. And so if you divide that by three, um, everything from here on over gives you 0.15%. And everything from here on over also gives you 0.15%. All right, now, if you break it up this way, now tell me, what is your guess for the probability that Z is between one and two, that blue shaded region? The answer to this problem is that blue shaded region. Yeah, and there you have it, exactly, 0.135. All right, so there's all different kinds of probabilities that you can estimate if you just use your, your knowledge of the empirical rule. Now today, we're gonna to start off with a problem where, yeah, there's an, this is a continuous, a continuous uh, random variable, so Z can take on any value along this, this number line. And so we're gonna be interested in calculating things like this. What is the probability that Z is less than, let's just say 0 0.36, like this. Now the first part of it is not hard because you know, we can draw this normal distribution that corresponds to any Z value. So I'm gonna draw the region. And again, while you're learning this, you know, definitely draw these pictures because you can, you can estimate like this one up here, you know, you can answer a question, is this area that we're calculating here or is this probability that we're calculating, is it closer to zero? Is it closer to one half or is it closer to one? And at least you can answer that question. And if you kind of pose that in your head before every problem, uh, you'll know that when you do the actual calculation, if you're kind of in the ballpark. All right, so here's one and two and three. Again, for our first few problems today, all of these probabilities will, the setting will be the standard normal where the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. All right, 0.36 is about uh, right here, let's say. And so Z less than that, would take you over here. So there is the area. There's the Z values. Less than or equal to 0.36. Now to get the probability, we're going to shade a region that corresponds to those horizontal scale values. You know, dot, dot, dot off to the side here. So if you're asked to calculate this probability, you can see that half of it, half of all the area under the curve would go from zero and beyond. And then from 0.36 over, you've got this half over here plus this other slice. So the answer to this one is gonna be somewhere between a half and one. So know that going in, but the area is equal to the probability here. Now we don't have the empirical rule to estimate this. And so I'm gonna to introduce to you a calculator function and the calculator function will help us. I'll also refer you to a table uh, that I gave last time and we'll get that one out as well. All right, so go to the Z table. Uh, I first wanna show you um, the 
the table calculation. And across the top, go to the 0.06, and then down here, go to 0 0.3. When you add these two numbers together, 0 0.03, oops, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.30, and 0 0.06, you get our boundary value 0.36. And then the way that this table works is that you intersect the 0 0.06 column with the 0.3 row, and in here will be your probability. Yeah, so here's the table that I'm talking about. <clears throat> Uh, this one was in the notes actually for yesterday. So if you want to get a copy of this, uh, just go to the, um, the e-learning site for the, for the Monday session. And this is just going to say Z table or standard normal table, something like that. Uh, but here it is. And so we want to go to where we see 0.03. Now, I'll try to magnify this. On the left side of the table, you have all the negatives. On the right side of the table, you have all the positives. So we're going to find, zoom in a little bit here. This is on the right side of the table. And if you go to point three here, and then over to the column, or 0.6 and see where those two match up, you see this number right here. Uh, there is a decimal point in all of these. It's kind of a small table to get everything on there. But it's 0 0.6406. It's this number here. So therefore, um, they're telling us that this area that we knew was a little bit larger than 0.5, somewhere between 0.5 and 1, that there is the number, that there is the area. So we, we have a table that will enable us to calculate that probability. And uh, as you'll look at this table, you'll see that the x values go from negative 3.4, where there's essentially little, so little area beyond negative 3.4, they just stop the table there. In fact, everything after negative 3.4, which you're going to see rounded to four decimal places, would be 0. 0.0000 or something very close. So they go all the way down to zero, and then they start up over here on the positives, and they go all the way down to 3.4. Anything area beyond 3.4, again, would be very close to zero. So that's why the table only goes from negative 3.4 to 3.4. All right, I want to do the same problem, and most of these other ones moving forward, I'm going to be using the calculator functions. And so <clears throat> instead of, you know, having to consult the table, um, the calculator function is um, much more valuable. So the probability that z is less than or equal to 0 0.36, we're going to use a, a calculator function called normal CDF. I introduced this right at the end of the period last time. But um, for this function, you have to give uh, four inputs. You have to give the lower bound. And these are the, uh, the z values along the horizontal scale. So think about it as the lower Z. And then you have to give the upper bound or the right Z value. So those first two correspond to our probability. And then mean and standard deviation. Now in all of our problems that deal with the standard normal, we know that the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. Later on, we're going to be doing application problems where the mean and the standard deviation are numbers that correspond with the application, and they're not going to be 0 and 1. In our particular example here, think of the region, 
here. Think about the lower bound of the Z corresponding to the purple line that I've drawn here. The, the lower bound would be negative infinity. So we're going to put negative infinity in there for the lower bound. The upper bound, the largest number on that Z, Z scale is the 0.36. And then we have the mean and the standard deviation. So for our example, we're going to use normal CDF. And here are our four inputs. Now, this number here, negative infinity, we don't have that on the calculator. But we know that there's so very little area beyond three standard deviations. So as long as we go out negative enough, uh, we will be get a, able to get a good enough approximation, you know, rounded to four decimal places on this guy. So um, you can use the lowest number on the calculator, which is negative one times 10 to the 99th power in scientific notation. Uh, I will be using probably just 10,000 because it's really easy to type in. And it's, it's a less, less enough, it's low enough. There's essentially no area to the left of negative 10,000. All right, so let me show you this display on the calculator. Normal CDF, uh, this function right here, is in the distribution menu. Same place where we found the binomial functions, binomial PDF and bi binomial CDF. <clears throat> and I think it's option two or three. Let's take a look. All right, right here is the um, bars key. Right above it is distribution. So this is where you find the binomial distribution. It's where you're going to find the other distributions that we use in this class as well. But it turns out that it's option number two, normal CDF. So let's go ahead and, and uh, calculate this. That we already know the answer to, right? Yeah, we, we, we've already calculated it. I'm, I'm just showing you a calculator way to do it. All right, so to your home screen, we're going to type number two, and then we're going to enter in negative infinity, don't have that. So maybe negative 10,000. All right, so when they say lower, for those of you with the menu calculator, your lower is going to be negative 10,000. Your upper is going to be 0.36. And then the mean is going to be zero. And then the standard deviation is one. For me, with the older calculator, I just have to separate all of those four. I need to know those four numbers, and I have to separate them with a, with a comma. And you shouldn't be surprised to see this number. And if you round that number to the nearest tenths, hundredth, thousandths, ten thousandths right there, you'll see that that number rounds up to a six, 0 0.406, 0 0.6406. And that's exactly what we got here. Okay, let's practice a couple of these. And uh, <clears throat> what we were doing is um, kind of uh, going through the lecture notes in 7.2. Uh, they introduced the, the standard normal. And, and here's the curve. And now we're going to, we just did a problem like, like this. It says, determine the area under the standard normal curve that lies to the left of, and then it gives you several of these, these values. So let's take a look at D here, right there. It says Z is equal to 2.90. So we're going to draw the curve. If you can envision what the left of 2.90 means you don't have to go through this step. But while you're learning this for the first time, I would say draw a graph for every single one until you don't have to anymore. So you can just say, oh, if this is the probability, by the way, to link it to what we've done before, since it says to the left, to the left of, that's over here, that's going to be Z is less than or equal to 2.90. They're just asking it in a slightly different way. All right, 2.90 
is way over here, very close to three, and then they want the area to the left. So I'm gonna shade all of this area. One thing that you notice about that blue shaded region is that it represents almost the entire area underneath the curve. And the entire area underneath the curve is equal to one. So we're looking for an answer that's very close to one. Normal CDF. And then we have, we're gonna do negative 10,000. And then we go up to our ending value, our upper bound. Here's your upper. Lower is way out there. And then we have the mean of zero and the standard deviation of one. All right, so this time I'm gonna use uh, negative one. And then if you wanna look for the EE key, it's right there. It's above the comma. It's what allows us to put uh, very big numbers or very small numbers into scientific notation. So I'm gonna hit the blue key and then the comma, 99. So this is uh, like one of the smallest numbers that you can have on the, on the calculator. That's what we represent as negative infinity. So negative one E 99, negative infinity. <clears throat> and the calculator key, let's see if I can do this. The E there is second and then the comma, and that gets you the E. All right, completing the rest of this, 2.9 and then zero and then one. And you can see that it's very, very close to one. But um, look at this number. It's correct to like nine decimal places. Let, let's, let me just show you what happens if instead of putting negative infinity, you put negative 10,000. See any different? Any difference? Well, now let's just do, instead of negative 10,000, what about negative 10? See, there's so, very few, there's so little area to the left of negative three that if we go out just to 10, look how much accuracy we get. Correct to, what is that, nine decimal places? 10 decimal places. So we're using negative infinity to be like way over there to the left, or we only really have to go to negative 10 in this context. I just use negative 10,000 because it's easy to type in and it works for most of our applications. So you can decide um, how you want to do it. All right, now, those are, the those are the ones that correspond to the values in the table, the less than probabilities, the to the left probabilities. We're also going to have a, a bunch of them that talk about calculating areas to the right of. So let's do one of these. Um, how, about, how about part B here? If you convert that into a probability, it would be the probability that Z is, all right, now to the right. So that's greater than negative 0.55. All right, if you can, uh, just go right to uh, normal CDF and then enter in the values that you need to put in there. If you can't see the lower, the upper, mean and the standard deviation are always the same in these problems, zero and one. It's just the lower and the upper. So if you can't see it just by looking at these symbols, then draw the graph. Zero, one, two, three, this is the Z distribution. Negative one, negative two, negative three. Z is greater than negative 0.55. So I think probably about right here is negative 0.55, somewhere between zero, about halfway in the middle between zero and negative one. All right, and then here is the set of Z values we're talking about. Z greater than, and then we draw a vertical line up to the curve from our boundary value and then shade everything that corresponds to our z values. So this is another one where you can see that it's a little bit more than half. So in this case, the negative 0.55 is the lower and the upper is positive infinity. 
So the first number now is negative 0.55. And then the upper number, so use one, now positive one E99 if you want. You can also use 10,000 and probably even 10 would work as we saw from our previous example. We know we're gonna get an answer a little bit larger than 0.5. So let's type these in, negative 0 0.55, 10,000, zero, and one. And so we get 0 0.708. Now, if you wanted to use, if you wanted to use this table right here, <clears throat> you can calculate a right area. And so what you do is you locate the negative 5.5, okay, so it's negative, and go down to negative 0.5 and over to 0.05 and find the number in this spot. But just remember that when you use the table and you actually find this area, you're actually finding not the blue area that we're interested in, but you're finding this left area here that we're not interested in. So what you'd have to do is to find the, the area we're not interested in. And since all of the area equals one, take one minus this area right here. All right, let's see. Here's the 0 0.05 column. And I'm gonna move it up. You see the number? Go ahead, type it in the chat. What number are we talking about here? what table value corresponds to negative 0.55? Go ahead and enter it in the chat. Or make sure that you're, you're seeing this. Yes, there it is, 0.2912. So 0.2912. But the table always gives us the right area. So that number right there is equal to this region here. So if we are looking for the left area, if we're looking for all of this area, and we know all of the area under the curve is equal to one, we can use the complement idea and subtract the left area from one to get the right area, what we're looking at. And guess what? One minus 0.2912 is equal to what we found. Okay, um, the next grouping, on the next page of the note sheet, uh, they give betweenness probabilities. So for betweenness probabilities, uh, let's just take a look at, um, how about C? Let's do one of these. If you wanted to link this to a probability, it would be the probability that Z is somewhere between negative 3.03 .03 and 1.98. If you can envision that, great. Enter it into your calculator and you're good to go. If not yet, then draw the curve. Identify the, X, the Z values along the horizontal scale and then shade the appropriate area above those Z values underneath the curve. That way you'll see the lower bound, you'll see the upper bound, and of course we know the mean and the standard deviation are zero and one. All right, well here's negative 3.03 .03 and 1.98 is about right there. And so here, is the Z, here are the Z values that we're interested in. And we're gonna shade the area underneath the curve corresponding to those Z values. And you can see that it's almost all the area. So this answer is gonna be very close to one. But for this one, we don't have to worry about infinity because we have the lower bound here and we have the upper bound here. So this would be normal CDF, negative 3.03 .03 to 
to 1.98. So it's always the horizontal scale values. The mean and the standard deviation um, always come last. So negative 3.03 comma 1.98 comma 0 comma 1. All right, 0.9749. Okay, so that will handle all of the probabilities that you'll be asked to do in the standard normal using normal CDF. I want to now introduce a new function for you because we're going to ask other questions where they give you the percentage of outcomes that they're after, um, you know, what z values would mark the, the lowest 10%, what z value would mark the lowest 10% of the data, or what z value would mark the, the top 10% of the data, or the top 5%. So let's take a look at questions like this. Which z value, okay? So now we're looking for a horizontal scale value instead of an area value. Which z value marks the lowest 10% of the data? All right, so I'm going to draw a picture once again. And the picture is going to be of the standard normal curve, the z distribution, the lowest 10%. Now, when they give us the lowest 10%, they're actually giving us the area under the curve. And so <clears throat> you might not know where to draw the vertical line here to represent the lowest 10%, but it's going to be somewhere in here. So, and the question is, what is this Z value? That's the other problem that we're going to be working with. All right, I'm going to introduce you to a, uh, well, let me get the table out first. These table values here are the area values. So all these are the areas, and these are the, the z values that go around the outside here. These are the horizontal scale values. But the numbers in here are the, are the areas. So, and the, according to this table, the shaded region there is the, is the left area. So all of these are left area values. So if we wanted the z-score that corresponded to 10%, um, and we know that 10% as a decimal is 0 0.10. And if we had to round it to four decimal places, like all the numbers in that table, then that would be 10%, 0 0.1000. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the number in this table that corresponds as closely as possible to 0 0.100. All right, so I'm going to look for those numbers. 0 0.100. Okay, here are the two. Um, 0 0.1 would fall between those two values right there, but that's the closest that we get. And the number that's even closest to this one is is five ten thousandths away. Oh, 15 ten thousandths away, and this one's only three ten thousandths away. So if we had to choose one to get an estimate, we would choose this one here. Now, which z value does that correspond to? I don't know if you can see it very well. Go ahead, write your number in the chat. That area right there is close to 10% of the left area. Go ahead and write your z value in the chat. I need to know if you're following along. All right, so you have the 0 0.08 right here. Good. And then you also have the negative 1.2. So it's like you're taking this number and then attaching the 8 to the end. So it involves both of these numbers to determine the z. So negative 1.28 for those of you that, that got it. So not only do you need the 0.08, but you need also the negative 1.2. Right, you can already see the limitations of using the table to calculate these z values if you're given an area, just because not every area um, fits in that table. So I want to introduce you now to a second uh, calculator function that solves problems just like this. And we're going to be doing the inverse of what we did before. So the calculator function that you want is inverse norm. And that function is also in the distribution menu. I think it's option three this time instead of 
option two. Now, the, the three pieces of information that are needed in order to execute this function is you need the left area and then the mean and the standard deviation. Now again, for all of our problems today, or that we're working on right now anyway, the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. So the only other number that you have to include here is the left area number. And you want to include this number as a decimal. So the Z value that we're looking for is inverse norm. Our left area here as a decimal is the 0 0.10. And then we have mean and standard deviation. So left area, mean, standard deviation. And let's see how close we can come to what we know the answer is, which is the one point, negative 1.28. Okay, so once again, we're going to go to the distribution menu. And you can see option three there. Inverse norm. 0 0.100, 0, and, and there it is. So you can see if rounded, you're going to get the negative 1.28. All right, let's take a look at um, how you would use the inverse norm function to, to do some uh, additional problems. Um, in, our, in, in the future, when we do uh, this classical approach to um, confidence intervals and um, hypothesis testing, uh, we're going to need to know what, this, what these numbers are. And you can see that when you have this notation, Z of alpha, where alpha is some small number, the alpha here is now the right area. You know, we could use the left area, but it's just that we would get all negative numbers. Left area is over here, since zero is in the middle, left area, you know, left Z values would lead to, uh, and left areas would lead to negative Z values. We want the positive ones, and so we switch it around. The area alpha is to the right of the value we're looking for. All right, so if you wanted to do a problem like number 20, z of 0 0.02, the picture that you would draw would be this one here, where this area off to the right is equal to 0 0.02. And if that area off to the right is 0 0.02, then the Z value that it corresponds to is Z of 0 0.02. And so what they're asking for here is similar to the previous problem we did. We're looking for a horizontal scale value that corresponds to this area. Now, what's important here is that the calculator function always uses left area. So in a problem like the one we're working on, where they don't give us the, the left area, we have to deduce what it is. So here's how we would handle that. Z of 0 0.02 is going to be equal to the inverse norm. And they gave us the right area here, an area to the right of a Z value. We want the area um, we need to find the area to the left in order to let this function work. So what if the right area is 0 0.02, then what is the left area, given that all the area must add up to, to 1? Well, we just take 1 minus the 0 0.02, and you get 0.98. So the blue region here is 0.98 that corresponds to the, to the right area of 0 0.02. They both have this boundary of Z of 0 0.02. But in order to get our function to work, we have to enter in 0.98 here instead of the 0 0.02. The only danger of writing um, the 0 0.02 is that you're gonna get the negative version of this Z value. So let's take a look. We're gonna do inverse norm and now 0.98. You'll know if you got it wrong, um, if you get a negative value here. And just to show you, if you do just say, oh, I just have to type in 0.02 here. 
see it gives you the same value, except it gives you the negative version instead of the positive version. Um, and I think usually they ask you to round Z values to the hundredth, 2.05. Oh yeah, 2.05. It's uh, over here, zero's in the middle. So one, two, and three, and it'd be just larger than two. Uh, the question was, what does this mean? And what is its numerical value? What it means is that we're looking for a z-score where a small chunk of the area over here is 0.025. And we're going to take that number and that becomes the right area. So it's just a fraction of the overall area. So if the right area is equal to 0.025, then the left area, which is the number that we need in order to run our calculator function, must be equal to 1 minus the 0 0.025, because the left area and the right area have to add up to 1. And that's 0.975. So z of 0 0.025 is equal to the inverse norm, the left area, 0.975, mean and standard deviation. And this is going to give you the number 1.95996398. All right, so you're going to become very, very, very familiar with this number, approximately 1.960. Uh, I think another example in there was uh, Z of 0.015. And we only choose very, very small values of Z, and you'll see why uh, later. These are going to be called critical values. And uh, when we're doing confidence intervals, and this number corresponds to the, to the alpha over 2, or the alpha. All right, very good. 2.170090375 or about 2.17. Okay, now before we get into the applications, let's take 20 minutes to um, do this worksheet. And um, you can see the kind of the general structure, a probability of less than or greater than, a less than and a betweenness. And then I ask you in a different context, the percentage of outcomes. And then I ask you to use the inverse norm function to find Z values. And then I ask you to go ahead and do what we just did and, and calculate some more of those Z's. So uh, we're only going to work on this 20 minutes, but I want to give you an opportunity to work together, make mistakes, figure them out. I gave you a normal curve for each one of these problems so you could do the shading. Now you're not going to be able to do the shading on the Google Doc, uh, you know, unless you have a way of, you know, copying a picture and putting it in there. Um, so. Just go ahead and write down the keystrokes that you use so you can refer to them later. And um, here is the link to the index sheet. So we're trying to figure out um, the top part of K and L. Uh, find the z-score that marks the 75th percentile and then find the two z-scores that mark the middle of the nine, the middle 90 percent of the area. Okay, so the top six problems use the normal CDF, right, where you're looking for a probability or an area value the mm -hmm. region and the last six use the inverse norm function so okay. um, these were the ones i think that we finished with so this is z of i don't know if you can read that it says z of 0 0.10 and in this notation they want to know what the z value is and that's a horizontal scale value z values are the horizontal scale values zero one two these are the z values down here and so you do what you do the best you can, but this represents um, the left area. So uh, it's going to be somewhere in here where this area right here, this, uh, excuse me, the right area, I think it was calling it left area, but the right area is 0 0.10. So because of where this is drawn, you'll see some problems that refer to the top 10%.
what's the horizontal scale value that corresponds to a, a, the area that, of the top 10%. And so to do this one, you would use the inverse norm function. But then you have to remember that the inverse norm function requires that the first entry is the left area, not what was given to us, the right area. We didn't do a percentile problem, but as you know, percentiles, they accumulate the zero percentile, you know, nobody scores lower than that. Right. The 25 percentile, 25 percent. Um, would score lower than that. So when we do percentile of 75%, we're really saying that the left area is 0.75. So this left area is equal to 0.75. Here's zero, here's one, here's two, here's three, so. negative one, negative two, negative three. So you, you, can, you can estimate based on where I've drawn this here, I know that 50% falls to the left of zero, but if we add this additional 34%, then 84% would fall to the left of negative or to the left of one. So 75% is somewhere between 50% and 84%. So that's why I drew the line in here. But see, now this is a Z value. This is not an area value. And that's one of the hard parts about doing these problems is to keep those two numbers straight. Sometimes you're looking for the horizontal scale values, numbers on along the horizontal axis. And sometimes you're looking for areas. So if you're looking for areas, like all these numbers up here, uh, mm -hmm. from A through F, all of these guys require something that involves area under the curve. And because of that, you're going to have numbers between 0 and 1, or percentages between 0 and 100%. Mm -hmm. And down here, you're looking for, you're given the area values, and you're asked to find a horizontal value or two. Now, um, in this one here, if they give you the middle 80%, they want you to find two Z values, the lower one and the upper one. So if you can find one of those, just take the opposite of it, and you'll get the other one because of the sym symmetry. Zero is right in the middle, and they mm -hmm. said middle 80%. Mm -hmm. So for this one, you would use inverse norm. And let's go for the lower one first. Now we know that the lower one is to the left of zero, so it has to be negative. Mm -hmm. And the area that corresponds to this lower one is 10% or 0 0.1, so the lower one. And the upper one, this one is even trickier. Because if you're looking at this upper one here, the lower area would include all of this 80%, but it would also include this 0.1%. So you have to, if you're going to consider the left area from here, you have to add both of those regions, the 80% and the 10%. Okay. So the number that you want to put in there is your left area number is 0.9. And uh, what you'll find is that these two numbers are opposites of one another. And this one's going to be, I think I saw negative 1.28, and then the other one's 1.28. All right, let's look at some applications. You're going to find that... Um, the problems that we're about to do are almost identical to the ones that we were doing, except they have an application. And when they have an application, they'll describe the scenario and they will give you the mean and the standard deviation. And the big difference is that instead of just entering in zero and one as those last two numbers in either normal CDF or in inverse norm, you're going to enter in the mean and the standard deviation from the problem. So let's just take a look at one of these here. I still recommend that you draw graphs. So assume like the random variable x. Now our horizontal scale values would be a bunch of x's. Normally distributed, so we can use inverse norm and normal CDF with a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 7. So now for this problem, every graph we draw, we're going to have 50 in the middle, and we're going to be jumping by 7s. Still, we're going to write uh, three standard deviations to the right and three standard deviations to the left. So 57 plus 764 plus 771. Minus 7, 43, minus another 7, 36, minus another 7, 29. So for 23 through 28, every one of your graphs will begin this way. And now the variable down here is x. It's no longer z. Remember, z was our, was our um, z score 
horizontal scale, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So I'll put the 0, 1, 2, 3 here, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, the z-scale on top of it. All right, now when you go to um, one of these probabilities, and let's just, you know, grab one, like, um, how about, well, there's a greater than, as you can see, the first two are greater than probabilities, the next two are less than probabilities, and the last two are between this probabilities. So whatever the case is, let's draw the uh, region, and how about if I start with number 24? Greater than 65. So I'm going to find 65 on the horizontal scale, okay, right there. Greater than 65. I'll draw that region on the horizontal scale and then shade the region under the curve that corresponds to the horizontal scale values. So this one is when we're given the norm, uh, the horizontal scale values and we're asked to find a probability, which is the same thing as finding the proportion of data values that fall greater than 65, which is the same thing as the area under the curve from 65 to infinity. All of these will give you the same number. But in this region, the lower bound is equal to 65. So that's the number that comes first. And the upper would be infinity. But because 10,000 is so far off to the right, my 10,000 will work here. And really we want infinity, so we just choose a large number and that becomes the upper bound. So that hasn't changed. But the big difference is the last two numbers that come in here. For every one of the problems in this section, the next number is going to be the mean, in this case, it's 50, and the last number is going to be the standard deviation, which is 7. So that normal CDF function is very powerful. It allows us to calculate probabilities in this context for any mean and standard deviation. 65, 10,000, and then 50, and 7. We can see it's very tiny because it's uh, the fraction of an area further than two standard deviations away from the mean. So that's a very, very small area. So that's, uh, that's the only thing that's new when we go to an application. Uh, they might also ask you to, um, you know, interpret that. And so we would say something like this. Uh, they don't give us a context. They just give us a mean and a standard deviation. All right, let's go down and do one of the problems in this next group grouping here. And notice again, it's a problem where uh, they give us a random variable X. It's normally distributed and they give us the mean of 50 and the standard deviation of seven. So it's kind of a continuation of this problem up here. But they ask it to us in terms of percentiles this time. So when we draw this one, the 90th percentile would be, we need to find that, I'm going to label the scale, uh, 50 and 57 and 64 and 71. So on over here. Same mean, same standard deviation. All right, now the 90th percentile, if we do number uh, 34 here, we accumulate percentiles from the lowest values up to some stopping amount. And somewhere in here, we know that 50% of, of the area falls to the left of 50, half of it exactly. And then if we go to here, remember that this was 34%. So if we add 50% plus 34% up to this point, it's 80, 84% would be to the left of 57. So just to give a kind of a benchmark as to where we would draw that 90 percentile, it's going to be somewhere in here. And percentiles correspond to left areas. 
So we're looking for the x value here that corresponds to a percentile of 0 0.90 or the 90th percentile. And if you are looking for a horizontal scale value, you have to use the inverse norm function. And remember the entries. The first entry is the left area. Well, a percentile is the left area. So we're going to put 0 0.90 in there. And the big difference in the application problems is you're not going to have 0 and 1 for your mean and standard deviation. You're going to use the mean and standard deviation from the application. 50 and 7 and left area. Now, when we calculate this, just keep in mind what you're looking for. You're looking for an x value that falls about in this region here. So it's going to be somewhere between 57 and 64. So 0.9 and 50 and 7. And it tells us that it's 58.97086. All right. So it's very, very close to 90 or 59. So the problems are the same. It's just that the mean and standard deviation switched up a little bit. And you can do every one with one of those two calculator functions. Okay, uh, one more application, and it has lots of problems. And I think probably that, um, see all of these are, are probabilities. So maybe I'll go to a different one where we can get a combination of calculating probabilities and figuring out, yeah, so gestation period. So uh, uh, it's kind of common knowledge that you know, in humans, the gestation period from conception to birth of a, of a human baby is about nine months. If you break it down further, they would say 40 weeks. And so we're going to be using that information. And here they, they're more precise. So uh, the gestation period for human pregnancies is approximately normal with the mean of 266 days. Now, if you take 266 and divide it by 30, right, because there's about 30 days in a, in a month, it would be about 8.86 months. And if you divide 266 by 7, which is the number of days in a, in a week, you'll get something close to 38. So uh, in this particular cohort, uh, about 38 weeks is how long the pregnancy took from conception to, to birth. And you can see it's close to nine months, close to 40 weeks, but not quite. And the standard deviation, some babies come early, some babies come late. But what's important here is that you pick out the mean and the standard deviation. And uh, notice that they're using the different meaning of they're using proportions here instead of, you know, percentages or probabilities. They're asked, or area under the curve, they're using the proportion. So what proportion of babies would fall, um, would be born in this range, in other words, is what they're asking. Okay, so uh, let's go to um, just with part A here. It says what proportion, you know, it's different wording, but it just, if they ask, what is the probability that a random selected, randomly selected pregnancy would last more than 70 270 days, that question is the same exact question as whether, or at least it's gonna have the same answer. All right, so proportion of pregnancies that last more than 270 days. There is no guidance as to what you would do with this problem. And so you just need to know to follow the procedures of what we've done before. Draw your normal curve because it says normally distributed here. In the middle, you're gonna put your 266, the mean, and then you're going to add 16 once, twice, three times to get the scale markings to the right. And then you're going to subtract that 16 once, twice, three times to get the scale markings off to the left. So if we add the 16, we get 282. Add another 16, 298. And add another 16, 314. Subtract 16, 250. Subtract another 16, subtract another 16. Now, once we get that scale, then we can estimate proportion of pregnancies that last longer than 270 days. So this scale is the number of days of the pregnancy. And so locate 270. 
Well, it's just a little bit higher than 266. And it's less than 270 or 282. So I'm going to put 270 about right here. And then less more than. So more than 270 would be over here. So the area that we're after is this area. And this area would be the proportion. Imagine that this normal curve is sitting on top of a histogram where you have all the data plotted in a histogram. What percentages of all those births would have a gestation period larger, larger than 70 days? So in a problem like this, where you're trying to find the, the probability or the proportion or the area, the correct function is normal CDF. So more than 270. Symbolically, I could write it as a, a probability like this, and then we do normal CDF. The lower bound would be our 270 of our shaded red region up there. Lower bound, 270. And the, the upper bound, since it's a greater than probability, is equal to infinity. So we'll use 10,000. And then we have to use the mean and the standard deviation of our problem. So 266 and 16. And from here on out, um, it's a calculator problem, uh, but reflect upon your answer. You can see that this region here, this red region, is less than 50%, but it's very close to 50%. So enter in the numbers as written here, and you can see 0 0.4013. So about 40% of the babies last longer than 270 days. They ask for proportion, so they want this decimal. All right, I want to jump down to F now uh, and do this one here because this is the one that uses the other function. All of these other ones are either proportions or probabilities, but it's this last one, part F, that <clears throat> allows us to use the inverse norm. A very preterm baby is one whose gestation period is um, less than 240. Oh, God, I guess that's a probability as well. Oh, well. I thought we would get into one with, with uh, an inverse norm problem, but we'll have to wait for that till next time. A uh, very preterm baby is one whose gestation period is less than 224. And so what we're going to do is, you know, is this unusual? Well, when we answer the question, is something unusual, we calculate a probability, and if the probability is less than 5%, 0.05, then we say yes, it's unusual. So what's the probability that the gestation period is less than 224? All right, again, we're looking for a percentage or a probability, so we're gonna use normal CDF. This is a less than probability, so we go as the lower bound, negative 10,000, up to our targeted value, our boundary value of 224. And then we have the, the mean and the standard deviation. So I'm not drawing the graph with this one, uh, but hopefully you can look at this later and see why I came up with these values. Let's type them in and we'll <clears throat> calculate this last probability, 0 0.00. Four, three. So <clears throat> since this would happen, or this does happen, only 0.43% of the time, we say, yes, it is unusual.